welcome to the Scam Economy with your host, Matt Bender. Crypto is having another big moment, and that moment is Russia's war in Ukraine. For weeks now, you've probably seen the headlines about how much money Ukraine has raised in crypto. And you might think to yourself, wow, that's amazing how much money they've been able to raise. And that right there is exactly what the crypto grifters are paying for. Welcome to Scam Economy. I am your host, Matt Binder. And on today's episode, we are going to dive deep into exactly what's going on in Ukraine with all this crypto charity that's coming in. Why? Why crypto? What's going on here? You mean this isn't being done in good faith? There's a lot to this. So before I drop all the various links to how you could support this show, I'm going to first just jump right in. Now, you may not remember this, but early on in the first days when Russia first invaded Ukraine, the Ukrainian government was not accepting donations via cryptocurrencies. They made this very clear and were quite explicit. But just days later, the Ukrainian government seemed to do a complete about face. A lot of people were actually shocked when the at Ukraine Twitter account, the official Twitter account of the Ukrainian government, tweeted out their official Bitcoin and Ethereum wallet addresses. In fact, when that tweet first went up, many actually assumed that the Ukrainian government Twitter account was just hacked. I mean, this is a regular occurrence on Twitter. Just two years ago, there was a major Twitter hack that saw bad actors take over verified accounts of major users, celebrities, uh, presidential candidates, in order to push crypto wallet addresses. But no, the tweet was legit. The wallet addresses actually belonged to the Ukrainian government. So what happened here? Ukraine was basically forced to accept crypto. They clearly saw the money on the table, uh, crypto on the screen, crypto that could have easily been transferred into fiat currencies and then sent to Ukraine. But they knew that wasn't going to happen because after all, what would crypto entrepreneurs and investors get out of it then? And that right there is sort of the explanation of it all wrapped up in a nutshell. TLDR, right? What's charity and humanitarian relief to most is actually just a big marketing scheme and PR campaign for crypto hustlers. Now, it's important to understand why the crypto grift is descending on Ukraine specifically. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. But first, I want to be very explicit here. The issue is not with Ukraine. You know, the country's being invaded by Russia and they're looking for various different ways to finance this war. In fact, extracting these funds from crypto entrepreneurs is probably the best thing their digital riches have ever been used for. You know, let them do their thing. But there's something just gross about these wealthy crypto entrepreneurs fully taking advantage of this situation, again, a war, in order to pump their cryptocurrencies of choice and generate good press. But, you know, it's fully in line with the scam economy. Now, Ukraine's digital friendly politicians have really been hyping up just how much they've been able to raise via crypto. And I mean, of course. They got to keep those donations flowing, right? You got to play the game. But crypto advocates have been pushing this falsehood that Ukraine has been completely cut off from their banking system and fiat currency. Now, that's just not true. You can go ahead and donate via your credit card, your debit card, wire transfer, whatever you'd like to Ukraine right now. On top of that, a number of NGOs that have been focused on relief in Ukraine have been accepting fiat currency via credit card or wire transfer this entire time. I mean, I'll wait a second. You can go ahead and donate good old US dollars right now. So just how much money has been raised in crypto for Ukraine? Now, this is an ever changing number because the situation is ongoing. And I've noticed that different outlets have reported slightly different numbers. And I'm going to assume that maybe this is because crypto is highly volatile. But according to the vice president minister of Ukraine and minister of digital transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, 50 million in cryptocurrency was raised in around the span of the first week via the Ukrainian government's official crypto wallet addresses. Now, one of the more recent numbers I've come across includes the crypto that was raised via Kuna, a Ukrainian crypto exchange. Now, according to the deputy minister of digital transformation of Ukraine, Alex Bornyakov, Around $100 million has been raised so far via crypto, with more than $60 million of that 
being raised by the main fund on that crypto exchange. Now, yes, you might be thinking that's quite impressive. That's a lot of money. But to put things into perspective, you have to realize again, not to listen to the cryptocurrency entrepreneur narrative that this is the best and really the only way to get money to Ukraine. Along with that 100 million combined in crypto, more than $300 million has been donated via fiat currencies, i.e. real money, to Ukraine. On top of that, in one week, the Ukrainian government also raised $277 million itself via a war bond, and that funding mostly came from within the country. And then, of course, there's the government aid. U.S. Congress recently approved of $13.6 billion in aid for Ukraine. And just Wednesday, as I'm recording this, after Ukrainian President Zelensky spoke in front of Congress, they pledged to approve a further $800 million. And then there's another $600 million coming from the EU. And the U.S. Agency for International Development is providing nearly $54 million in additional humanitarian assistance as well. And you can guarantee there's a lot more aid to come. And that's not even counting the military equipment countries have pledged to send Ukraine. But let's get back to the crypto. With nine figures worth of cryptocurrency sitting in the Ukrainian government's crypto wallets, what exactly is it being spent on? According to the Ukrainian government, in week one of the war, the country spent $15 million of the donations it received in cryptocurrencies on military supplies such as bulletproof vests and night vision goggles. So far, they say they have not used any of the crypto donations on lethal military gear. This has all been non-lethal military supply purchases. Now, the question here is, are they actually paying in crypto? And the answer is uh, some. They've found some suppliers willing to take crypto, but not most. According to Ukraine, 60% of their military suppliers uh, are not accepting crypto, which means that they then have to take those cryptocurrencies and exchange it for US dollars or euros. Now, what cryptocurrencies have been sent to Ukraine? Uh, the vast majority of the crypto donated to Ukraine are Bitcoin and Ether on the Ethereum network. But they have also received donations in the stablecoin Tether, Polkadot, Tron, Dogecoin, and Solana. And the story about how they came to accept a bunch of those different cryptocurrencies, some of which you listeners and viewers may not have ever even heard of is quite interesting, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But on top of the cryptocurrencies, Ukraine has also received hundreds of NFTs, according to Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation, Bornyakov. In an interview with Bloomberg, Bornyakov said, yes, someone donated us a CryptoPunk, but it's so hard to sell. We haven't used it at this point. We are going to keep it for now. We are going to work with NFTs a little bit later. We are focused on things we can deal with right now. There's no time to figure out how to convert them. Maybe once things settle down, we'll figure this out. Now, this is where the like depravity of this entire situation comes in. Why are people sending NFTs to Ukraine? Now, the whole point you hear from these crypto advocates is that cryptocurrency is the fastest way to get money from point A to point B. I mean, especially now when they're here saying that, hey, in a time of war, it would take days for your fiat currency to actually land in someone's bank account. But with crypto, you can get your funds to someone in seconds. Why send someone an NFT? For people who don't know, I'm going to explain. I I've explained it on every show, but if you're tuning in for the first time, NFTs are non-fungible tokens. Basically, strings of characters that sit on a blockchain as a token that act as a digital receipt to basically prove ownership over a piece of media, a... Uh, JPEG, a movie file, uh, some sort of artwork online, whatever. That's all it is. It is an ownership over a receipt. The person does not actually own the artwork, whatever it is, that the receipt links to on the blockchain. 
But it's a speculative asset nonetheless, and people buy and sell these NFTs, and some of them go for quite a lot of money. Uh, there's a real bubble here, and what better example than the value of this 8-bit digital artwork known as a CryptoPunk that was sent to Ukraine? $200,000. But that's if they find a buyer when they can take the time to sell it on an NFT marketplace. And this is where the discrepancy in the real amount that's been raised via crypto comes in. Are, are, are the NFT values being factored into the equation? Are they calculating the value of the crypto when it's donated to them, when they sell it? Honestly, it's very unclear to me. But what I will say is that it's still a very large sum of money. And one of the things that Ukraine is smartly doing is that they are pretty much spending the crypto as quickly as it comes in. Because again, cryptocurrency ebbs and flows. $100 in a cryptocurrency could be $100 today, could be $150 tomorrow, it could be $50 tomorrow. At least if you cash out right away, you're guaranteed to get exactly whatever it's worth at that very moment. In fact, this is sort of pissed off a number of crypto advocates if you look online because a lot of them are strong believers in HODL, basically holding on to their crypto and never selling so the value continues to appreciate according to their hopes and dreams. But one thing they view as not good is that if the Ukrainian government is raising all this money in Bitcoin and Ether and then they're selling it off in massive amounts of quantities in a short period of time, it's going to tank the value of their precious cryptocurrency. Again, they're thinking of numero uno, number one right now, and that's them and their wallets. To the moon, right? Now, everything I've spoken about so far has been regarding donations to Ukraine's official cryptocurrency wallets. They are obviously the main place where everyone has been donating. There's a few other ones out there, but another one here I want to talk about is Come Back Alive, an NGO that directs its support to the Ukrainian military. You might have heard of them when early on in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they were kicked off of Patreon for breaking Patreon's policies in terms of what you can raise funds for. Believe it or not, Patreon does not want you raising funds for another country's military. Come Back Alive is probably the second biggest charity when it comes to crypto donations. Again, second to the Ukrainian government. And crypto advocates like to promote how, look, they were kicked off of Patreon and they needed a way to raise funds. And crypto was there for them. That's all they were able to do, raise money via crypto. And that's just not true once again. They've always had a link on their website where you can directly fund them via fiat currency from your credit card, your debit card, whatever. But one interesting thing I noticed when researching Come Back Alive's cryptocurrency wallets is just how much they've been spending. Now, like I said, the Ukrainian government's been pretty smart. They get the funds via crypto, they immediately spend them. Come Back Alive has mainly done that with the tens of millions of dollars it's received via Bitcoin. But for some reason, if you've donated to Come Back Alive via their Ethereum wallet on the Ethereum blockchain, your donation has likely not been used at all. For some reason, this organization has been just sitting on all this ether, millions and millions of dollars of ether, uh, quite frankly, for months. Now, yes, the vast majority has come in since the beginning of the war that started in late February, but there were funds from even before that that haven't been spent. I, I will say, if they're just saving them up, it doesn't seem like such a smart idea. Because again, the volatility. If they were to exchange that Ethereum for fiat currency right now, they're guaranteed to have something like over $4 million. But who knows, maybe this will pay off for them. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Now let's get to the crypto pushers who are using a war to pump their coin on the backs of a country fighting for its survival. If you recall just a little bit ago, I mentioned all the different cryptocurrencies that the Ukrainian government was accepting. How did we go from, no, we're not accepting crypto, to, okay, here's our Bitcoin and Ethereum wallets, to, here's our wallets for pretty much anything? The Bitcoin and Ethereum one makes sense. Those are hands down the two biggest cryptocurrencies out there. There's a lot of money flowing on those two blockchains. And if you want to extract some of it and pry it out of their hodling hands, you're going to have to give something to them in return. Ukraine accepting donations via crypto, 
further establishes that this whole industry isn't going anywhere. We're seeing investors buy further into cryptocurrency companies over these past few weeks. And the good PR helps tell the general public that, you know, this crypto stuff is good. It's helping Ukraine, right? I mean, don't just take it from me. Ethereum co-founder Joe Lubin basically said this very thing in an interview over the past couple of days. According to the Ethereum co-founder, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine was another moment for our industry. It represents crossing the chasm into mainstream adoption. Now we're on to national security issues. It's going to be so profound, a point of no return for our industry, because it's clear that our technology is very powerful and unstoppable. And it, it just gets more ridiculous from there. Because those alternative cryptocurrencies were basically adopted by the Ukrainian government because their founders basically dangled a carrot in front of Ukraine. They basically begged the Ukrainian government publicly in the country's Twitter replies as it's trying to fundraise for donations to fund the literal war they are currently undergoing thanks to Russia's invasion they're literally in ukraine's twitter comments saying you accept my crypto i'll donate a lot of money but only if for example gavin wood founder of polka dot tweeted to the ukrainian government if you post a dot address i'll personally contribute five million Justin Sun of Tron, who recently was the topic of a report in The Verge that detailed all the shady ways he's made his money via crypto. Sun tweeted almost word for word what Wood of Polkadot tweeted. If you post a TRX address, that's for Tron, I'll personally contribute one million. The Ukrainian government ended up accepting those cryptocurrencies because how could they not? And, you know, those weren't the only two begging. Uh, Sonny Liu of the VeChain blockchain company tweeted in reply to them as well. Set up a VET wallet and leave VET address. I'll donate $8 million. Nothing else matters comparing people's life. If that was true, Sonny Liu can take his crypto and convert it to even just other cryptocurrencies that Ukraine was already accepting and donate the money in that way. I, I guess I should note, though, that in this case, it doesn't appear that Ukraine took up the offer of Sonny Liu from the VeChain. And as disgusting as the groveling from these wealthy cryptocurrency founders is, as they try to promote their coin using a country in wartime as a promotional vehicle, they're not even the most bizarre response I saw. The Celsius Network, a blockchain platform slash decentralized finance company, tweeted out a bizarre message, including Bitcoin and Ethereum wallet addresses where you could donate to Ukraine. What's so bizarre about that? Well, those weren't the wallet addresses that the Ukrainian government tweeted out. The Celsius network seems to have attempted to accept crypto on behalf of Ukraine, saying that their way was the safe and controlled way for some reason. But honestly, still not the craziest thing going on here. The real insanity happened when the Ukrainian government announced that there would be an airdrop to everyone who donated to the official Ukrainian government wallet address. In the crypto world, in order to generate more interest in, well, whatever it is you're doing, whether it be a crypto token, whether it be a Web3 project, some sort of NFT work, again, whatever it is, you'll find that the founders of these various different projects often do an airdrop, which is basically a way to give a gift, frankly, to everyone who's already invested in whatever it is you're doing. Now, that gift can be tokens or NFTs. Some people view it as a collectible item to show, you know, you were there early on during the project's early days. Most people view it as just another money-making opportunity, a free asset in which they will take and immediately turn around and sell off. And if you're wondering what the vast majority of crypto advocates view airdrops as, I can guarantee you it's the latter. In fact, as the Ukrainian government found out, it is a mistake to think that the crypto community 
will not view whatever it is that you airdrop to them as a speculative investment asset. And Ukraine probably realized what a mistake it was when they saw just how much more donations were pouring in immediately after they made the airdrop announcement from crypto people trying to get in before the cutoff date for the airdrop. We're literally talking about a few hundred Ethereum donations throughout the day for days with suddenly a huge spike on the day this airdrop was announced. Huge. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of more Ethereum donations just from people who ostensibly wanted to get in on the airdrop. Don't just take it from me because again, Ukrainian politician Bornyakov said this very thing in an interview with Motherboard after Ukraine announced the next day that they were going to cancel the airdrop. In a tweet before the airdrop was supposed to go out, the vice prime minister of Ukraine and minister of digital transformation, Fedorov, tweeted out, after careful consideration, we decided to cancel airdrop. And in that motherboard interview, Bornyakov says that it became clear that a lot of people were abusing the possibility of an airdrop by sending minuscule donations just to benefit themselves. People started to want to profit, said Bornyakov. Personally, I don't think it's ethical. If some enterprise decided to do an airdrop and they aim for profit, that's okay, but he didn't believe it was acceptable to profit off of an effort to support a non-profit cause, especially like supporting a nation at war. And to further assure you that canceling the airdrop was the right move, just listen to some of these tweets from Justin Sun, the founder of Tron, when he found out that people who donated via his cryptocurrency we're going to be excluded from the airdrop. Answering to the humanitarian appeal from Fedorov. Tron community has donated over 1.2 million, but now the airdrop just ignores them completely. It is just unfair. We need to fix it. It is not a matter of expecting a return, but if an airdrop is going to all that donated and excluding us is unjust. It is not for me. It is for over 5,000 people have donated to Ukraine in the first place and expected nothing for return. It is just unfair to exclude them. Every donation should be treated equally. And he went on for like seven tweets, literally complaining to a country at war that people who donated via Tron weren't going to receive this stupid airdrop. Again, the point was to donate money to Ukraine, not to pump up the use of your crypto, which I guess you viewed as a spectacular backfiring because I guess people who donated via Tron would have walked away with the idea that by donating via Tron, they didn't get anything in return like the people who donated via other cryptocurrencies. It's just a wild way to look at these things. And it's also quite funny that uh, Ukraine probably pulled off maybe the biggest crypto rug pull in history, so far at the very least. And I can tell you, just like those donations rocketed when everyone thought they were going to get something in return airdrop to them, the donations very much subsided once crypto people all found out that they weren't going to get some speculative asset in return. It's not only the cryptocurrency founders either. Cryptocurrency exchanges have jumped on the pump our crypto product on the backs of the war in Ukraine train. Crypto exchange FTX announced that they were going to give every Ukrainian on their platform $25 for free. Trying to outdo that, the Kraken exchange just announced that they were going to give over 10 million worth of aid to clients in Ukraine, valued at approximately $1,000 each in Bitcoin. Do you realize what they're doing there? Like if FTX and Kraken really wanted to donate to the relief efforts in Ukraine, 
There are a number of organizations, even the Ukrainian government itself, if they wanted to, that they could donate directly to. But instead, they want to give funds only accessible via their platform, essentially doing what like Vegas casinos do when you sit down at the slots and they just keep bringing you free drinks. And when you spend enough, they'll maybe even comp your hotel room too. Will many Ukrainians just cash out and take their $25 or $1,000 respectively and just exchange it for real cold hard cash? Or will at least some take that money and gamble it away in hopes of making at least a little bit more on FTX and Kraken. I can assure you that both of those exchanges are betting on just enough to do the latter. And on top of that, Kraken also announced that the funding for that $10 million worth of aid to their Ukrainian clients is going to come partly from their revenues on Russia-based trading. I guess to make themselves feel a little bit better off of still profiting via what can be considered as blood money. In addition to the established currencies and exchanges, there have also been a number of crypto projects that have been set up over the past few weeks, specifically to raise crypto for Ukraine. There's honestly been so much, there's no way I can fit them all into one episode. But I do want to focus on just a few. One, for example, and probably the biggest charitable effort set up in light of Russia's war in Ukraine is the Ukraine DAO. Now, a DAO is short for a decentralized autonomous organization. The way DAOs are supposed to work are that people buy into a DAO's token in order to receive a vote on whatever it is a DAO is for. Crypto people like to promote it as like democracy in its purest form. Although the problem is that usually your votes correlate with just how much crypto you invest. Meaning that if you got more to invest, you have an outsized influence on whatever the DAO is voting for. But with all that being said, the Ukraine DAO did end up raising $6.75 million in cryptocurrency. They did this by pooling contributors' money together in order to buy an NFT of the Ukrainian flag. This effort was put together by Alona Shevchenko, who is Ukrainian in England, and the Russian punk collective Pussy Riot. Now, to be fair, I dug into this, and looking at what Shevchenko and Pussy Riot put together, it does seem like they did this with the best intentions, a true rarity in the crypto space. They were transparent as to where the money went after they distributed it, and they did distribute all $6.75 million to a number of organizations, primarily the Ukrainian government, and come back alive. But then they unintentionally made what I'm sure they view now as a mistake. They did what the Ukrainian government went out of their way to avoid and that is an airdrop. And seeing what happened with Ukraine DAO's airdrop, we can really get an understanding of just what a disaster the Ukrainian government avoided with their much bigger fundraising effort. After the fundraising drive via the purchase of this NFT, the Ukraine DAO then set up an airdrop for a love token, which they said was supposed to be a commemorative sort of gift for everyone who donated. But see, that's a big mistake. Like I said earlier, that's not what a token is. Cryptocurrency is not a piece of memorabilia. It's not the equivalent of giving a PBS tote bag to everyone that donated. Tokens are a financial asset, period. And by giving them out as part of a benefit, you're essentially defiling the very essence of charity. And even though Shevchenko went out of her way to beg cryptocurrency exchanges not to list the love token, they still did anyway. And once the love tokens were dispersed, people started to sell them on the exchanges for profit. Because again, that's what cryptocurrency is. 99% of the space is people looking to get rich quick and fill their money bags. And another point to make here is even though the charitable effort that Ukraine DAO put together was a success, it's not proof that DAOs can be successful because the Ukraine DAO wasn't really a DAO. Yeah, it says D-A-O in the name, 
But there was no democratic process in dispersing the funds that were raised. Those few people, including Shevchenko and Pussy Riot, that put the Ukraine DAO effort together, they're the ones who exclusively chose where the money that was raised goes. If this was a true DAO, wouldn't this have been a process where everyone who donated got a vote on it? But that's not what happened because this isn't really an example of a DAO. If you look at some comments on Twitter, people who donated to the Ukraine DAO were pretty upset that their donations weren't going to organizations working on humanitarian relief for Ukrainian citizens, but instead were donated directly to parties who were putting their funding towards the Ukrainian military. Another questionable Ukraine crypto charity I came across came from none other than Shepard Ferry of Obey Giant fame. The artist created a piece of Ukrainian themed NFT art that was to be minted for 0.05 ether. That's approximately $140 today. Now here's the good. 100% of the proceeds were to go to Ukraine. But here's where it gets kind of weird. Those proceeds, while going to Ukraine, would first go through the Ukraine DAO and another separate Ukraine charity group focused on NFTs called Relief, where the E is actually a three, you know, for Web3, very clever. Now, Relief was put together by someone who helped former presidential candidate Andrew Yang form his Web3 project, Lobby3. Now, not to go completely off on a tangent here, and I'm sure I'll do an episode on Lobby3 specifically in the future, but Lobby3 is Yang's Web3 project, which he claims will help eradicate poverty. But the website just lists ways where you can become a member by donating anywhere from $200 to $100,000 in Ether. Yeah, it's weird, but also what you would expect in this space, I guess. But anyway, back to the Obey Giant NFT project. For some reason, instead of donating directly to the Ukrainian government or Come Back Alive or any of the other NGOs, the proceeds from Shepherd Ferry's NFT project for Ukraine goes through Ukraine DAO and Relief who both just then take that funding and then disperse it to the Ukrainian government and come back alive and those various NGOs accepting crypto themselves. I, I, I don't quite get what the point is other than, yeah, another way to sort of just pump up these other crypto projects. By just going through these extra steps, they're also giving less money to the actual organizations that are going to use them because every time there's a transaction on these blockchains, you're getting hit with fee after fee. But yeah, 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 100% of the sales goes directly to these organizations. So it sounds good until you dig further and find out a little bit more because before the fairy art for Ukraine went on sale in order to raise money to donate, he gave them away for free to people who already held on to NFTs from his previous project, Degenerate slash Regenerate. And I'm not criticizing that because it takes away possible donations from those Ukrainian organizations. I'm criticizing it because by doing that, he's basically creating a secondary market for his Ukraine fundraising NFTs. And I came across a few of those myself. On NFT marketplaces like OpenSea, people who received the Ukraine NFT artwork from Ferry, they were then going ahead and selling it on those aftermarkets, undercutting the 0.05 Ether price to the general public so that they could make a tidy little profit themselves. And yeah, there is royalties on this artwork, so Ferry will receive 10% of whatever those people sold the Ukraine NFT for. But again, another instance where the cryptocurrency world leaves open an opportunity for third parties to profit off of what's supposed to be a charitable donation, especially in this effort, again, when it's to a country at war. And you've heard about the selfishness of some of these crypto founders and the mistakes made by even those with good intentions who don't really seem to quite get the point of the cryptocurrency space. But what happens when we get to the actual 100% bad actors here? For example, the fraudsters who are trying to scam well-intentioned people who want to donate via crypto to Ukraine, but find themselves accidentally donating 
to an address belonging to someone who's just trying to steal their money. Within the first week of the Ukraine war, the domain monitoring company, Domain Tools, found that more than 4,200 domain names were freshly registered, which included the term Ukraine or Ukrainian. Now, not all of those domains were used for nefarious purposes, but a good chunk of them were. For example, within hours of the invasion on February 24th, Domain Tools discovered URLs such as support-ukraine.eu and donate-to-ukraine.org, which were set up to take donations for unspecified organizations. The crypto wallets on those websites were connected to no reputable organization. On top of that, I myself uncovered similar domain names, such as Crypto4Ukraine.com. The website set up a QR code as well as donation links where users were able to send specific crypto, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin to a number of different crypto wallets. Now, just looking at these websites, when I was researching them, they were quite clearly scams. But the text on the website were able to appeal to the emotions of people just looking to help. And that's usually how people get scammed. You know, and as evil as these scammers who are looking to profit off of the goodwill from people looking to donate to Ukraine are, uh, they're not even the worst. For example, while it'll be hard and quite frankly, probably impossible for the Russian government to significantly get around sanctions using crypto, mainly because the liquidity of literally running an entire country's economy is just not there. The money doesn't exist in crypto. Russian oligarchs and other wealthy people in the country are looking to use crypto to funnel their money out of the country so they can move their riches somewhere else. <laughs> in one example, one anonymous Russian going through a broker wanted to sell off 125,000 Bitcoin roughly $6 billion worth of it. We've also seen how crypto can fund the delusions of a madman, like El Salvador's authoritarian dictator, President Bukele. Also, there are bad actors within Ukraine who are using cryptocurrency to fund their operations as well. By now, you've probably heard of the Azov Battalion, the neo-Nazi paramilitary group that has officially become embedded as a unit in the National Guard of Ukraine. Yeah, these are the guys where Putin's bullshit justification of the war, the denazification of Ukraine comes from. According to the cybersecurity firm Flashpoint, the Asav Battalion has already raised thousands and thousands of dollars directly with their own crypto wallets. And, you know, this is just the beginning for them, too, you know. A report from the Southern Poverty Law Center in December found that white supremacist figures have raised millions and millions of dollars via cryptocurrency. And sure, you can argue that whether it's from crypto or even funding from the United States, some of that funding is going to end up funneled to bad actors in Ukraine regardless. Again, I just said the Assault Battalion is actually embedded as official part of the National Guard in Ukraine. Ilhan Omar actually tweeted out a very poignant concern when she said the consequences of flooding Ukraine with billions of dollars in weapons likely not limited to just military specific equipment, but also including small arms plus ammo are unpredictable and likely disastrous, especially when they are given to paramilitary groups without accountability. I mean, she's absolutely right. And this wasn't a critique of cryptocurrency funding. This was a critique of US government funding in general. It's certainly a very real concern. But see, this is where the real difference comes from because the US Congress has actually previously stipulated that aid to Ukraine could not be used to provide arms, training, or other assistance to the Azov Battalion, specifically naming the Azov Battalion. You can't make that request with crypto. And as Jacob Silverman of the New Republic pointed out, cryptocurrency people will flip on a dime on Ukraine if it's in their best interests. He writes, some have given up on politics entirely and will switch sides in a war based on how it affects their wallets. And we saw this directly 
when Ukraine asked various cryptocurrency exchanges to cut off their Russian based clients. Some cryptocurrency advocates were outraged and even signaled that they weren't sympathetic to Ukraine anymore based on that request. It's been quite amazing too to see the crypto community basically bang on the war drums. For such a long time, there was this push among all the different things they say cryptocurrency will fix. One of them is it will bring about peace because in their explanation of things, without fiat currencies backed by governments to fund the wars, there would be no war in the first place. Here we are, ironically, in 2022, seeing this big crypto moment. And what is it? Cryptocurrency being used to directly fund war. Once again, everything they argue crypto can do is not only untrue, but the opposite of what they say is true. And then of course there's the environmental issues. Hundred million dollars just to the Ukrainian government in cryptocurrency. The number of transactions, just astoundingly bad for the environment. And to give you an example of how less damage you could have done, if you just donated via regular means using a credit card or a debit card, let me break this down for you. One visa transaction consumes about 1.5 watt hours of electricity on average. The average energy use per Bitcoin transaction is 2,258 kilowatt hours. Again, one Bitcoin transaction, 2,258 kilowatt hours. 100,000 Visa transactions, 148 kilowatt hours. A single Bitcoin transaction requires roughly 1.5 million times the same amount of electrical energy. And if you're wondering just what that amount, that 2,000 258 kilowatt hours could be used besides a single Bitcoin transaction, that amount of energy could be used to power a single U.S. household for two and a half months. What, what, are, what are we doing here? How is it that as a global society, as we've become more aware and attuned to the very serious issues ahead, thanks to climate change, we've decided to dive right in to a technology that's making everything astoundingly worse. Now we know that the cryptocurrency people are just going to brush aside all those different concerns. Uh, and they're going to try to replicate this, what we're seeing in Ukraine, uh, elsewhere, I'm sure, regardless of what ends up happening with the war, how long, how much longer it goes on for, they're certainly already setting their sights on the next place. I mean, we already see what's going on in El Salvador, and I will do episodes entirely on that in the very near future. We are already seeing what's going on in Puerto Rico, and I'll be doing episodes on that in the near future. In both places, the locals have tried to fight back massive protests in El Salvador, activists in Puerto Rico comparing crypto people who've moved in there to colonizers. Just like they're seeing in Puerto Rico and El Salvador, they're not going to find anywhere quite like Ukraine. And let me take a little bit of time to go into the background of Ukraine and its long connection to cryptocurrency. Because this really could have only happened in Ukraine. Over the years, Ukraine has increasingly become more crypto friendly, even moving to pass a law legalizing cryptocurrencies, which President Zelensky actually just signed into law on March 16th. The country has also moved to create a virtual asset designation that basically provides a tax incentive to crypto businesses. But even aside from those recent moves, Ukraine has been big into crypto from well before that. In fact, it's been recognized as one of the nation's fastest to adopt cryptocurrency. Bitcoin, for example, was prominent in the country going at least as far back as the Euromaidan protests in 2014. In fact, Ukraine got into Bitcoin so early that at one point, nearly half of the Bitcoin network's processing power was 
mm, well, centralized in Ukraine. And of course, as crypto became more prominent in Ukraine, so did the scams, because naturally the cryptocurrency world attracts that sort of person. But along with the usual scams, frauds, and money laundering that comes with crypto, Ukraine is actually a unique place for all of this. According to Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, Ukraine is the second most corrupt country in Europe. And listen. Before Vladimir Putin tries to use this to justify his recent actions in Ukraine, the only country in Europe on that list that's more corrupt than Ukraine is in fact Russia. But you know, crypto scams have flourished in Ukraine. Uh, in one example, Sweden's foreign minister had to actually reach out and demand that Ukraine do something about a cryptocurrency fraud operation running out of Kiev, which was referred to as a fraud factory. A report from Chain Analysis found that Ukraine actually comes in first in some metrics for crypto fraud activity, even outpacing the U.S. It won't be easy for crypto advocates to find another country like Ukraine, which has hundreds of blockchain businesses running in the country. But, you know, they'll sure try. And hopefully other people start to see through this crypto pushing marketing ploy, PR campaign bullshit. And I know all this could be quite frustrating. Trust me, I spent a lot of time putting this all together. So I wanted to leave you all on a rare upbeat note, I guess. When looking at all of the crypto donations to the Ukrainian government's official crypto wallets, there's one that stood out to me that's particularly fun. One of the highest Ether donations on the Ethereum network $280,000 came from a wallet that made $3 million in just minutes late last year. How did they make all this money in crypto? Well, by scamming. The wallet that made this six-figure donation to the Ukrainian government had earned its funds via an altcoin called Swift Token, which rug pulled its investors. Basically, this wallet held on to a lot of Swift token at the very beginning. Usually that would be someone who would be the founder of Swift token or someone connected to the founder in some way so that they could amass this large amount of Swift token before the retail investors could buy in. And when the floodgates opened and people started investing in Swift token, this whale holding a large amount of this token decided, hey, if I sell off, I could, I'll, I'll, hey, if I sell off, I might crash everything and take everyone's money that they've invested into it, but I'll make off with three mil. Yeah, so one of the largest Ether donations to the Ukrainian government came from money that was scammed out of other crypto investors. That's cryptocurrency, baby. Now, of course, it's time for me to push the scam economy. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash mapbinder. Without your support, I literally cannot continue to do these big deep dives like I did in this episode, and it would be very hard for me to continue the show at all. Uh, so again, if you have the financial ability to do so, go to patreon.com slash mapbinder and help grow this show all your funding goes into making this show even better. My next goal is to bring some people on board so we can make additional content, more content for all of you in exchange for your fiat currency. You can also support this show by subscribing to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash mapbinder, our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash mapbinder. Consider dropping a super chat on YouTube if you're watching this live or if you're going to watch the post show live stream directly after this. Consider becoming a paid subscriber on Twitch. And in fact, if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you get a free Twitch Prime subscription each month. That's right. You basically get to dress up like Robin Hood, and extract money from Jeff Bezos's pocket and give it to me at no extra cost to you. It's a win, win, win. Again, just go to twitch.tv slash mattbinder and subscribe to the channel via your monthly free Twitch Prime subscription. 
could also follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder. Also, you can now follow this show on Twitter too, at Scam Economy. Thanks to a kind fan of the show who happened to actually own the at Scam Economy Twitter account. Uh, thank you so much for your kind donation of the Twitter account, Twitter user at Orwellian. And of course, if you don't want to financially donate, the best thing you can do is A, tell everyone you know about Scam Economy, whether it's in real life or online, and then B, go to Apple Podcasts, go to Spotify, and please, please, if you can, leave a review. It has been so important to the growth of this show, I can directly see a correlation between where we are on the charts, which is based on those reviews, and how many downloads and new subscribers we get each week. Uh, you can go to scameconomy.com as well for all the links to everywhere you can listen to this show, whether it be the video version or the audio one. Oh, also check out my political show, Doomed, at doomedcast.com as well. And with all that being said, I hope you'll all join me for the post show if you're watching live. And if you're not watching live, you can catch the audio version of the post show on Patreon for patrons. Again, I take call-ins, discuss whatever you'd like to discuss in the comments, your questions. It's a good time. And to everyone not joining me for the post show, be sure to tune in for the next episode, which will be the next time I see you in the scam economy.